I think Kyle was somewhere seven, eight years old, something like that. He's the best friend of Philip, our youngest son. And um, they, we lived on the same street, just a short block from one another. These two guys grew up, um, born, same, really close together. They grew up like brothers. I mean, Philip and Kyle were inseparable. Uh, they both eventually were in the band. They both went to Scottsdale Christian Academy. They spent years together and just loved each other. I mean, these guys were special. We got a phone call that Kyle had been hurt and broken his leg, it sounded like, and was taken to the hospital. I think I got to the hospital about the same time that Linda, Kyle's mom, did. So um, he had actually moved, they, they actually had him in a room, which was amazing, and the doctor came in and had, had all the x-rays and stuff like that, and they decided that they were going to have to put traction into his leg, and they were actually going to drill through his leg and put a pin in there and then hook traction onto it. I don't know what the doctor was thinking, if he thought I was the dad or what. I thought I introduced myself as the pastor. But he says, um, I need you to hold Kyle while we do this. Now they gave him medication and all, and supposedly he wasn't hurting. I say supposedly because for what seemed like an eternity, this doctor's trying to drill on this kid's leg. We're holding, Linda and I are holding him down and he's screaming, Mom, stop him, Mom, stop him, Mom, stop him. And I'm like, give him more pain medicine. How come we're doing this? Couldn't you at least put him to sleep? This is torture. And I'm not sure who was feeling more of the torture, Kyle or Linda and I. Why were they doing that? Now, afterwards, as soon as the doctor was done, Kyle was just kind of like, okay, he was fine. Had this pin literally through his leg up here and traction on it. Um, and almost as if it hadn't hurt at all. But I'll tell you, Lynn and I were sure traumatized. <laughs> and I'm not even his dad. <laughs> but sitting there holding this little boy, I went, oh, man. It was one of those tough, tough moments. And you're, and you're like, okay, are you sure this isn't? I think I'm more than once. Are you sure this isn't hurting? <laughs> you know, do, can, can you stop? I mean, already? You know, how long is this going to go on? You know, if you've been a parent and you've taken a little child into the hospital, have you ever been one of those times where they were in the cage? Little, little ones? They used to put them in the a crib kind of, I call it a cage, because it literally had rails all up the side, and, and as they take them into surgery, they're all inside of that, and you're like, you know, ah, you know, what are you doing to this child of mine? I mean, it's tough. It's painful. Why in the world would a parent do such a thing? Because, because Linda and I love Kyle, and we knew that he had to go through that in order for that leg to heal properly. And we endured what was, in, in some ways, still a nightmare. <laughs> and, and I have to wonder if it wasn't a nightmare for, for Kyle. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> we endured that because we knew that the pain was going to lead to healing. Our... our text today is a great text that talks about clothing yourselves with love. Clothe yourselves with love. The, the, the title and the focus that I want to ask you is, does love ignore sin? Does love ignore sin? If if Linda didn't want to hurt Kyle, what would she have done? Uh, sorry, Doc, you're not going to do this. As soon as he started going in there and Kyle's screaming and, Mom, stop him, Mom, stop. She, if, she, if she didn't want him to hurt, what would she have done? Doc, you stop right now. I'm taking over and you're not going to do this to my son. You're not going to hurt him. Really? And Kyle would have been what? Crippled for the rest of his life. Crippled. Because we're talking about a pretty serious break right up here. What's that, the femur or whatever? I mean, it was serious. Major, major break of his leg. 
and he would have been crippled the rest of his life. Now, which, which, love, which love's going to win? <laughs> the love that just doesn't want to cause any pain, so, so you just don't do anything. The love that says, I'm just not going to point out sin. <laughs> How many of you have seen a child in the grocery store and the parent has decided not to point out their sin? <laughs> And the behavior gets just a bit unruly, and, and, it's, and it's actually literally affecting and influencing you <laughs> because of whatever that child might be doing. Screaming, yelling, hollering at mom, telling her to shut up. I mean, whatever, right? And, and mom may be so worn out with this that she just doesn't have the energy to say, stop it one more time. But there's some <laughs> who, well, mom kind of never really did feel like she wanted to discipline, wasn't that happy to have the baby anyways, and so the, the child didn't get disciplined. Does love ignore sin? In the statement that we have on marriage, it says we believe that every person must be afforded compassion, love, kindness, respect, and dignity. Every person, right? That hateful and harassing behavior or attitudes directed toward any individual are to be repudiated and not in accord with Scripture nor the doctrines of the church. Our challenge, friends, is to show love even when we're addressing sin. It would be interesting to find out. How many parents are here? Who are, right? Parents? Yeah, come on, raise them high, be proud. Okay. It would be interesting to find out from the parents how many of you ever sinned when you disciplined your child? How many of you got just a little bit angry? And yeah, you, you don't have to tell. <laughs> how many of you even maybe hollered at that child? Or maybe when you did the punishment, were just a little bit overboard on the punishment? Quit smiling, dear. <laughs> She's like, yeah, Bill. Yeah, do you want me to tell you how many times? No. <laughs> There's not a parent here, unless you're perfect, who hasn't made a mistake at some point in time in the discipline. Punished a little more severely, a little more difficult, hardly, maybe even gotten angry when they were doing the punishment and took it out on the child. There's not one here that hasn't probably done that. But there is, a, and obviously you can become abusive, right? And, and we would not encourage that. Uh, you, can, you can become so forceful and mean-spirited. For example, whipping a one-year-old is out of line. Okay? I'm sorry, it's just out of line. Okay? But yet you do start to discipline a one-year-old, don't you? <laughs> don't forget why the two-year-olds have the terrible twos. Because you've been saying no so much to them that they've learned to speak that word back to you. <laughs> okay? Discipline is necessary if we love. But never hateful, harassing behavior or attitudes directed toward any individual are to be repudiated and they're not in accord with Scripture nor the doctrines of the church. How do we show love and address sin? Does Jesus ignore sin? Jesus, Jesus is so loving, isn't he? Uh, well, we would say, no, he didn't, he didn't ignore sin, at least not with the Pharisees. But is it only the Pharisees that he points to sin? Well, I mean, we'll remember stories like the one in John 8. Woman caught in adultery. Brought to Jesus. And what does the law say? The law says if you're caught in adultery, you must be stoned. And they bring the woman. Uh, by the way, just, just a little parenthesis here. The law said that they were both caught, who were caught in adultery. Because you know adultery doesn't happen with one person. Just, just, you know, in case you didn't know that. Adultery is two people. And if you're caught in adultery, that means both people got caught, right? So if you were going to bring the people caught in adultery to Jesus, who would you have brought to him? 
Not just the woman, but the man too. But, I don't know, I guess the guy must have slipped away. Who knows? Or was he a setup? Who knows? But they bring the woman caught in adultery and they say, okay, here, stone her. And you know the story, right? Jesus says, well, okay, if, if we must stone her, whoever is without sin, you go ahead, you throw the first stone. And he starts writing in the sand. I like to try to think about what he might, might have written in the sand, right? You know, okay, here's the date that you sinned. Here's the date you sinned. Here's what you, I don't know what he was writing in the sand, but he was writing. And as he's writing, they all walk away. Because every single one of them knows that they've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even though that's a, right, a, a verse from Paul. They still know the fact. <laughs> They're all, they all have sinned. And they all leave. And he looks up at the woman and he says, where are your accusers? Well, um, they've all gone. And then he says these incredible words. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now, does he stop there? No, he says something else, and it's really critical to hear this. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you, but now, go and sin no more. Did Jesus ignore sin? Oh, my. Not at all. And he's the one, by the way, incidentally, who has the right, doesn't he? He's the one without sin, and if he had thrown a stone as he had authority to do, what would the rest have done? Thrown their stones, wouldn't they? But Jesus is here for one purpose. Why did Jesus come? Well, think about this. Jesus came. In fact, Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Mary is told to name Jesus Jesus because he is coming for one purpose. And what's that purpose? Save people from their sins. At the end of Luke, when, when we're finishing with this whole commission for ministry, he says, and repentance and forgiveness, this is chapter 24, verse 47, repentance and for, forgiveness, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, Jesus, to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. In John 8, it says, right before Jesus makes an incredible statement, he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then in verse 34, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And then verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Does Jesus ignore sin? No, because he came to free us from sin. And so he's going to address it. He's not mean-spirited about it unless you're a Pharisee religious person who's ignoring everything in the about it, and then he might call you a hypocrite. But he is addressing sin. Matthew 9. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous. But who? Sinners. Does Jesus ignore sin? No, he came to call sinners. He's even saying that. That's why he's there eating with the tax collectors and sinners. I, I came to call people who are sinning. The guys that you, you know they're sinning even. And there's more than one place where he makes that same statement. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? To feel good about themselves. I, I, I've called, come to call sinners so that Everything can just be okay, and they go on because this is just the way they were born. No, and he says, I've come to call sinners to what? Repentance. To change. Matthew 9, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And how does he prove that he has that authority to forgive sins? He heals the paralytic he tells the man, get up and walk. I'm going to prove to these guys that I have authority. Because what's easier, to say, stand up and walk? 
or to say your sins are forgiven. Well, if you don't really have the power to say your sins are forgiven, then it's sort of easy just to say, oh, your sins are forgiven. But to prove, he says, that I have authority to forgive sins, and they're all upset about that fact, he says, now, to prove it, you get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. What did Jesus say about the Eucharist? Communion. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for what? For the forgiveness of sins. Jesus sets this brand new meal up for us and the meal is a reminder that Jesus comes to forgive sins. And then Luke 17, watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. We actually have responsibility for one another. Therefore, Colossians 3, 12 to 14, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. God says, look, because I've chosen you, I want you to get dressed like one of my children. And here's what you should put on if you're going to dress like one of my children. He says, put on compassion. Compassion. Uh, And and the word there is, it's a heart of compassion. It means to, to have feelings with action. You know, and, and the word is, it comes from the word splankna. It's the word for guts. When you, when you feel stressed, where do you feel it? In your feet? No, n- generally in the gut, right? And, and literally, that's where they thought of as, the, the, in a sense, the heart. It's the seat of emotion. He says, look, you need to put on compassion. You need to clothe yourself with feeling. It needs to affect your gut. You need to have something working on you on the inside, and that needs to come out in your actions. You need to do something about it. Larry Richards said this word for for compassion is a pitying exclamation torn from the heart at the sight of another's suffering. God compassionately and truly cares about what happens to us. We are to imitate our Heavenly Father and let His kind of caring bind believers to each other in unity. God calls us to have compassion on others. That call is more than appeal for us to feel and for others. For the needy, it is a call to care enough to become involved and to help by taking some action that will set others' lives on a fresh new course. When I'm holding on to Kyle, I had to have compassion. I couldn't just feel bad for him, but I was feeling bad and holding on to him so that that doctor could do what that doctor needed to do. Compassion. It hurt. I felt it. And yet I'm going to hold on because of what Kyle needed. Put on compassion. Put on kindness. Ray Stedman says kindness is action that reveals compassion. It's the action that starts showing how compassionate you are. It's action that rises out of a sense of sympathy for someone else. It can take many different forms. Think about this. Kindness. A smile. A kind word, a pat on the shoulder, an invitation to lunch, an offer of help. We are to put on compassion and kindness as we start our day and throughout the day. If you start the day, those of you who live with somebody, your spouse or somebody else, right? How do you start the day? Do you start with kindness? Or do you look at them and say, well, you've never looked worse. (laughs) Show kindness to one another. Centuries ago, a certain young man from a rural setting went to live in a large city and fell on the wrong crowd. He lived a wild and dissolute life, becoming involved in many hurtful things which almost destroyed him. But he heard a preacher one day, and though he did not particularly appreciate this man's preaching, he was struck by the man. So he went to hear him again and again. And soon that preacher whom he didn't like his preaching, was able, able to lead this man to Christ. That young man 
is the man that's referred to as St. Augustine. Augustine wrote of Ambrose, pastor of the cathedral in Milan. I began to love him. Not at first as a teacher of the truth, which I despaired of finding in the church, but as a fellow creature who was kind to me. What can kindness do? Put on, in addition to compassion and kindness, put on humility. It's interesting, there really isn't a Greek word for humility. The Greeks and the Romans didn't believe in humility. They were prideful people and they thought humility was a weak thing and they thought it was a, a terrible thing to say, those Christians are humble, as if that's something bad. Humility, the word that we use for humility is low-lying. It literally means to think or judge with lowliness and therefore it speaks of the humiliation of the mind. It's an unpretentious behavior, a humble attitude, modesty, or without arrogance. The word indicates the esteeming of oneself as small or recognizing one's insufficiency at the same time recognizing the power sufficiency of God. Humility really is a right perspective of yourself. But take note, humility is not a perspective that's too high, I'm wonderful, or too low, I'm such a horrible worm. No, no, humility is this right view. It's a God view of yourself, but it's not this one that exalts yourself. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but is really not thinking of ourselves at all. When you dress yourself with humility, you're thinking about others rather than trying to think of yourself. In addition to humility, put on gentleness. <laughs> well, the definition I found for that is it, the quality of not being overly impressed by one's own self-importance. Gentleness. Don't be overly impressed with how important you are. It's a, a quality of gentle friendliness. Another word that we've used for it is meekness, which also translated literally is strength under control. Again, they probably would not have liked that, but doesn't a soldier have to have strength under control? If you get too angry, you get out of control. If, you, if you're not able to control your emotions, you will do things that are improper. You're going to make mistakes, just like the parent who gets so angry at something their child has done, they start throwing things and hollering at them, screaming at them, and whipping them, and pretty soon they're abusing them. Oh, no. That is not meekness. That's the opposite. That's anger strength, power, out of control. Put on gentleness. Someone else called it, it's a restrained patience. <laughs> it's patient trust in the midst of difficult circumstances. And, and you've seen it where a parent says, okay, oh, I do not like this behavior, but they control themselves and how they respond. Restrained patience, which leads us then to the next one. In addition to gentleness, put on patience. It's, it's the capacity to be wronged and not retaliate. Ah, interesting. See, there's this other aspect of patience. That here's somebody's doing something wrong to you, and you patiently say, no, I'm not going to give it back to them. So the person cuts you off, and instead of doing what you would love to do, and not just because you're afraid, you don't cut them off. You don't wave the bird. You don't holler and yell. You simply take control. It's the capacity to be wronged and not retaliate. It's the ability to hold one's feeling in restraint. It's what God does with us. He withholds judgment, though he has the right to. He waits to return because he doesn't want any to perish. He has not destroyed evil or anyone on the side of evil. 
at this moment because he is still hoping that people will change, will repent, will come back to him. So put on patience. It's that self-restraint that does not hastily retaliate for a wrong. <laughs> it bears insult and injury without bitterness and complaint. Oh, did you have to say that one, Bill? <laughs> so patient means I'm not going to complain? <sighs> Romans says the kindness and patience of God is what leads us to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so he waits and he withholds judgment. He withholds punishment like we probably deserve because he wants us to come to him. And then he says to put on bearing with one another. It means to endure to hold out in spite of persecution, threats, injury, indifference, or complaints, and not retaliate. To bear with somebody else's wrongs and mistreatments and not to punish them back for what they've done. Bear with one another. And then finally he says what? Put on forgiveness. Forgiveness. Byron Paulus is the executive director of a revival ministry called Life Action Ministry. Spoken to thousands of people. In fact, he says, after reaching out to more than 4 million believers in 6,000 churches during the past four decades, our team of revivalists would unanimously concur that the number one problem they encounter in the church is what? Un. Forgiveness. He says, bitterness is rampant. Forgiveness is not. And in church after church, as Life Action proclaims the truth about bitterness and forgiveness, we hear powerful testimonies of God setting captives free. The road to forgiveness in my life was grounded in the biblical example modeled by Joseph, a man who had every reason for bitterness and hate, yet who emerged from years of rejection and hopelessness as a forgiver, full of grace, still honoring the Lord. For me, true forgiveness has meant daily choosing between two options, two responses in my soul. Paul says, forgiving or bitterness. Which are you going to choose? Put on forgiveness. How did Jesus say it? If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then what? They are not forgiven. And then finally, as he's concluding this text, he says, and now over all of this, it's kind of like the, the coat on the outside of all these other articles of clothing he says over all of this now he says put on what love put on love Hebrews chapter 12 <clears throat> therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured, what? Endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose, lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Has anybody died trying not to sin? I, I think no. I don't think any of you have died because you all seem to be breathing still. Okay. So none of you have died to the point of trying to get rid of sin that you've been shedding your own blood. He says, and ha you have forgotten 
that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, my son, oh, I guess girls, you don't have to. Now I'm thinking it's for all of us. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Have you looked at the context of Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14? I mean, isn't this a wonderful passage? Look, therefore, clothe yourselves with these wonderful things. Compassion, kindness, gentleness, meekness, hum humility, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, just as you've been forgiven by Jesus. And over all of this, put on love. But have you looked at the context of Colossians 3? You, you, you may want to read it along with me. He starts out, because don't forget, in verse 12 it says, therefore, you, you've all heard, this is not my word, so just, you know, just laugh or ignore me. Um, you've all heard the phrase, when you find a therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. <laughs> right? Okay, so what's, what's this therefore? Therefore, put on this clothing. What's it there for? We'll look back at this beginning in the first part of chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Since Jesus Christ died for you and you've accepted his payment for you, now set your heart, set your mind, put your focus on Jesus Christ who's on the throne because he died for you. Set your mind on things above, not on the earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden from Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Okay, we're setting our heart what? On the future, that someday we're going to be there with Jesus in glory. Amen? Put to death, therefore, because we want to get there. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Okay, let's skip this next session because it's not real fun, okay? He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all, all such things as these, anger, rage, Malice and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with these things. Because you've put off the old person. And you're becoming a new person in Jesus Christ. And you're stopping certain sinning and instead you're starting to become like him. And you're looking forward to Jesus Christ. You're looking to the throne. You want to get there to be with him. Because of that, he says, therefore, as God's chosen. And you've been selected by him. God's called you to be holy. He says, now, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect love. And continue the context. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish. Oh, there's a word we want to skip, right? 
as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Did you know that some parents are extremely cruel in their punishment? The punishment does not match what the child has done. There are some parents who are abusive. They discipline in ways that is actually criminal. So therefore, we should rule that all parents should stop disciplining. Wouldn't that make us have a wonderful world? <clears throat> It's interesting, this one word in there, and it's a word that we kind of struggle with, isn't it? Don't we? And it's that word. We're supposed to teach and admonish one another. By the way, it says to do that with songs and hymns and all different kinds of tools, right? All kinds of resources. But we're supposed to teach and admonish one another. And he says this, right after he said, clothe yourselves with love. And that everything is really about love. And a parent who is unwilling to discipline their child is a parent who doesn't love their child enough. And a brother or sister in the body of Christ who is unwilling to go to their brother or sister and say, you offended me, I need to let you know, and, I, and, and please, can we work this relationship out, is unwilling to forgive, is what? Not loving. And the word there that we have, that we have a responsibility for each other, is to admonish one another. Have you ever thought about that? Why do you come to church? You, you've come here, right, because you want me to give you some nice comment, Right? You want me to make you feel good so that when you go back out there where it's tough, you feel good again, right? Is, is that why you're here? I mean, don't, isn't that what people kind of say? We're, you know, I go to a church because I want to be fed, but really what if it, I want to be blessed. I don't want to be bored. I want, I want them to do something that I want, right? I want to go out of here with something making me feel good afterwards. Is that what you want? Because here's the problem, is that the word of God doesn't always make us feel good. Amen. The word of God actually causes us to correction. And the fact is, is that as we preach, and I, I'm going to just be straightforward with you. Every Sunday I preach, my desire is that you would apply the word of God. Therefore, my desire is to make you a little bit uncomfortable. Hopefully not from me, hopefully from the Holy Spirit, so that you will look at things in your life and say, am I doing that or am I not? And do something about it. Now my desire for that for you is because I love you. I want you to become more like Jesus Christ. I want you to experience the power of God at work in your life. I want you to become so much like him that people see Jesus Christ in you. And understand that that might mean that you need to repent of something. And that it would be actually unloving for me to say, it's okay for you to do something. It's okay for you to be bitter. If that person was that abusive with you, just hold on to that, okay? Wouldn't, would that be right for you? See, here's the problem when I say that. I'm telling you, hold on to the garbage of somebody else. Forgiveness is about me letting go of somebody else's trash. And I say, I'm carrying around something that somebody did to me. And as long as I'm not forgiving them, not only is it hurting me, and not only am I opening up a place for Satan in my life, but I got this stinky stuff back here. Do you know what they used to do when a person killed somebody? And they were found guilty of that? They strapped the dead body to the person's back. Because you've killed this person, now you need to suffer with them. And you know what would ultimately happen? It would kill them, slowly, in a nasty kind of way, because as this decaying body is decaying on your body, you're decaying. It doesn't sound like very much fun, does it? But see, that's what unforgiveness is. I'm going to carry the dead body, the dead trash, the dead garbage of somebody else. Forgiveness says I'm going, to, I'm going to let go of what this other person has done. It doesn't mean that they're free. It means I'm free. Forgiveness is about me letting go of somebody else's wrong. It's not about saying, oh, they're fine. No, they never did it. No, no, no. Forgiveness is all for me. It's confession and repentance that is for them. And reconciliation doesn't happen until they understand the hurt that they caused me. And for some, reconciliation never can happen, especially when there maybe has been sexual abuse. All I'm saying is forgiveness helps me. And the word says, here, admonish one another. 
Romans 15, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to admonish one another. 1 Corinthians 4, I am writing this not to shame you, but to admonish you as my dear children. The word he uses is warn. Colossians 1.28, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. As we challenge and encourage and admonish one another, we become full and mature in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who what? Admonish you. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, verse 14, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. 2 Thessalonians 3.15, yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them, admonish them as a fellow believer. Well, you're all ready for lunch. <clears throat> Stories told of a little piece of wood that bitterly complained to its owner who kept whittling away at it, gouging it and making holes in it. But the one who was cutting it paid no attention to the stick's protests because he was making a flute out of that piece of ebony and he was too wise to stop when the wood complained so bitterly. The man said, little piece of wood without these rifts and holes and all this cutting, you'd be just a stick forever, a useless piece of ebony. What I am doing now may seem as if I am destroying you, but instead it will change you into a flute. Your sweet music will charm the souls of many and comfort sorrowing hearts. My cutting you is the making of you, for only thus can you be a blessing in the world. Richard DeHaan says the meaning of this little parable is clear. That flute whose music blended so sweetly in the orchestra was made a flute only by the knife and file that filled it with rifts and holes which seemed to be its very destruction. But the purpose of the master was that it might become a melodious instrument to the praise of God. <clears throat> James McConkie was a well-known Bible teacher and he went on a tour of um, the Swiss Alps. And he was with a guide and a whole group of people. And they had this experienced guide who was leading them uh, across a very dangerous gorge in the Swiss Alps. One point, one of the hikers on the tour de decided that they didn't want to stay with the rest of the group. They were getting tired of following this sim same line. And they started to head out across the snow on their own. The guide went running after this man, tackles him to the ground, grabs him and pulls him back in line. And then he says, if you had kept going on that, the way you were heading, it's ice covering over a huge cavern that's thousands of feet, and you would have fallen to your death. Why does love get tough? Because it's love. And if we care about one another, then yes, love will point out sin. Father, help us not to be afraid to love. Teach us how to love, Father, as a loving parent who is willing to discipline. Teach us to love one another. But don't let us get so overzealous at it that we're just going to attack everyone else's sin. As Lord, you've clearly taught us to deal with the, that big plank in our own eye before we go to help our brother with their speck. Oh, Lord, call us to repentance, Jesus. Clothe us with compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, with the ability to bear with one another and to forgive one another. Clothe us with your love. In Jesus' name.